ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the Game Changer Podcast. Here are your hosts, Victory Bell and Nate the Effin' Great. What is up, you guys? It's your friendly neighborhood belt bro, Nate the Effing Great here, and I'm being joined here by the Jackie Burthart to my fez. Yes, that's a that 70s show reference, and it's kind of fitting, actually. It is indeed the one, the only, Victory Bell. Yeah, hi, good morning. And guys, get basically, if you don't understand why I'm making that reference, check out her recent photo shoot. It's absolutely awesome. And like I said before, I'll say it again, reboot that 70s show. Make this woman Jackie Burkhart. I'm sorry. That's just... Mila Okunis, eat your heart out. <laughs> yeah, I'm more of the size of Donna, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they can get Gail Gadot to play Donna. Although, that would be kind of one of the craziest crossover deals I would ever see. Okay, I kind of want this to happen now. But anyway, <laughs> we're not here to talk about crossovers. We've done those episodes already. We're actually hyping up the movie that's going to be happening tonight, guys. And that is Avengers Endgame. And remember, hashtag, don't spoil Endgame. It's one of those movies that has definitely been a a once-in-a-lifetime build, and it definitely deserves the proper respect. So much respect, guys, that we are definitely going to be waiting until two weeks to do this review from today. So bear with us, but we are going to have a little bit of fun. We will have some Endgame news that we would like to kind of talk about, some very interesting deals, as well as some kind of predictions we're going into it because I believe we had this deal where we're kind of betting on how many times we're going to get either emotional, shocked, we're going to have like comedic moments, but we'll get more into that a little bit later on during the show. But let's finally break the whole deal that I've been saying on Facebook for this whole time. Of course, this episode is also going to be talking about that we've been kind of, uh, what was the phrase I was looking for? Oh yeah, screwed by Disney. Yeah. If you guys didn't catch that hint, then uh, it's kind of one of those things that it's hard for me to put it any more blatant than that. So this kind of was brought on because, and it'll actually go into a perfect segue into the first point that I'm going to make for what you know a reason why I feel Disney is screwing with us or screwing with me in particular is the fact that when we did an episode, and on that day I actually made the comment, well, there hasn't been a Star Wars trailer. The day after... They, of course, released a Star Wars trailer. So for me, I wanted to put that on here as a bit of a joke. But at the same time, it actually kind of does bring up a valid point when it comes to uh, Disney kind of screwing with not only me, but also with the fans. And that is, they're putting out way too many Star Wars movies. I mean, you kind of look at it. With all the previous Star Wars movies installments, you know, you had Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, they had years to kind of, you know, just be spaced out, and we didn't have to worry about all these crazy, you know, stories. They did the same thing with the prequels, too, and while granted, two out of three were not exactly the best, they were still spaced out for people to kind of, you know, just kind of get everything set into place for the next movie. Now, unfortunately, ever since The Force Awakened happened, we haven't really gotten a break from that. It's been one Star Wars movie, and then another, and then the other Star Wars movie, and then another Star Wars movie, and another, and another, and another, and another, and another, and another. It's one of those things where I think that it's just very much one of those situations where somebody might make the case of, well, I mean, they're doing that with Marvel all the time. Yes, but... But here's the difference between Marvel and with Star Wars, in my opinion. With Marvel, they kind of have it to where there's a different variety of stories that they put out every year, but also the stories are very quick to grasp onto. It's kind of one of those things where it's like, okay, we got this, it's a good movie, and in and of itself, it's kind of one of those standalone movies that works out pretty well, and that can go for any of the movies building up to Endgame tonight. Whereas the Star Wars movies it definitely needs to have some space for the fans to actually appreciate it that much more. And even though they're doing these spinoffs, it's just one of those things where it's just too much. And for me, that's one of the first things I think about when I think about Disney kind of screwing with me is the fact that they're giving me way too much Star Wars. I kind of liked it when they had the spaced years, but now that they're giving us one Star Wars movie and then a spinoff, and then they have the other Star Wars movie and then a spinoff, it's too much. 
it really is too much and it's not going to benefit it. And that's probably one of the reasons why people are hating Star Wars movies even more to this day. That's just my opinion on it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't have much opinion about Star Wars because uh, I'm not the hugest of huge Star Wars fans, so I don't want to like take someone's opinion. Like, I, I don't think I deserve to really weigh in on how good they are or how bad they are. Um, but I definitely felt that I was not getting excited at all. Like, I, I, I know the first one after they brought, uh, like, the, this next series of three movies. Um, I think everybody was stoked about that. I, I actually went to opening night of that one just because it, it, it was a long time coming. Um, and like you were saying, it just kind of got to, like, you expected a Star Wars movie and kind of how some of the Marvel movies are. They're just not that, they're not up to par because they were just trying to spit them out so quickly. Yeah. No, I definitely could have put it any better. Uh, so what is one of the reasons you feel wronged by the mouse? By the mouse? Because um, we both agree that we're not going to take a shot at Walt Disney. Bless us, bless us. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, I will just start off with a very current one. I didn't see this one, but I, I think I'm just going to say, uh, the Tim Burton contracts in general, I don't think are really great. Um, mm. I think the early Tim Burton stuff, the claymation type of stuff was interesting and different. And that's kind of what you were like, Oh, that's Tim Burton. That's his style. And now he's been kind of, um, streaming, not streaming, seeming himself into more of the live action, and the more I hear Tim Burton, the more afraid I am about a movie, and I think one of the most current movies that came out that really held his name to it is Dumbo, and I think everybody that has seen Dumbo and everybody that has seen the critics kind of know that it's a typical Tim Burton eh, film, just like all of the Alice in Wonderlands that we got. They're just, eh. They're not amazing. They are a little dark, a little dreary, a little too Tim burton to be Disney magical. And I think so. I think the more Disney partners with Tim Burton, the more it's not going to be a great live action film. <laughs> no, I definitely do see where you're coming from. It is kind of a weird combination. You have the dark mind of Tim Burton against the kind of light, fluffy, and very, I guess, family-friendly version with that, you know, Disney provides. It's just one of those combinations that it just doesn't really seem to work out that well. And obviously, you mentioned a lot of the examples of that, where it doesn't really always work out. And so far, honestly, I guess we can say it hasn't worked out at all, so... One or two yeah, things. Yeah, I think the last time it really, I think the last time he really hit it big with Disney was the Nightmare Before Christmas, uh, mm -hmm. and that, that was a long, long time ago. And I think that movie was his niche. Like that was what Tim Burton needs to do. Like it's supposed to be kind of creepy, and it was like a Halloween type of movie. So people were like, "Whoa!" Like, okay. This is crazy and weird. I like this. Um, but then you bring up these magical stories that people have fallen in love with, and you're trying to a little bit creep them out. It's just not working. And Dumbo is definitely one of those magical stories that I think people are a little, people were a little frustrated with the fact that it didn't do as well as they were predicting. But I definitely think Tim Burton has his place in movie making. I think he definitely has a style and a signature in his movies. But maybe he should partner with another production company or another huge company that would really, really go with his vibes versus making this kind of awkward film that has both and you don't really need the you don't really need the Disney magic when you're getting the like creepy magic in there you know like it's it almost takes away from his thing and it takes away from Disney's thing like you were saying so they, they don't they don't mesh 
And if they don't mesh, they probably shouldn't be together. Well, I'll, I'll give her credit where credit is due. Tim Burton, when it comes to, like, backgrounds, he's phenomenal at that. When it comes to, like, you know, stories, playwrights, stuff like that, that's where he just seems to kind of struggle a little bit. So I think if they just keep Tim Burton on the background deal, then it should be fine. But if they continue having him doing, you know, screen rights and stuff like that, yes, it's going to be a really rough next few years for us, especially for Tim Burton fans. Uh, but yeah. keeping on the live action deal, um, there were actually two live action movies that I do feel I was kind of robbed with and I was feel kind of wronged. And uh, the first one that came to mind that uh, we discussed was the Cinderella live action one. And it's kind of one of those stories where it seemed like it was an easy movie to kind of create. You have the story, you have the characters. Now, granted, I understand where some of the, you know, I guess, betterments of the film actually went. Because they gave, you know, the prince a little bit more of a backstory. Hey, that's great. They kind of developed some of the characters a bit more. Awesome. But the problem was that unlike movies like, say, The Jungle Book, Beauty and the Beast, uh, Pete's Dragon I would even throw in there, the problem was that there was no real connection for, you know, a lot of the people that grew up with Cinderella to really look at this movie and say, hey, this is kind of the movie I kind of grew up with, because they lacked quite a few things. One, of course, being that they took out all the songs that were in the original Cinderella, which pissed me off immensely. The second thing was that uh, they literally probably could have just put in r actual rodents into the deal because they had these CGI rodents that were supposed to be, you know, like Jack Jack and Gus Gus or something like that. If you were going to do CGI, you might as well have just had them still be, you know, the, the mice that could just, you know, talk and they could do that kind of stuff. But instead you just decided, no, they're just random mice that are there. We're basically spending $2,000 on something we could have saved on by getting the actual real thing. It just, that's what really irritates me about it. And we also see how, you know, the actress, God bless her, she does a fantastic job in other roles. This is not one of those roles that I look at and say, oh, this is a surefire, like, Oscar-nominated, worthy kind of a performance. No, she really turns out to be a very ditzy blonde in this one. And I'm not trying to say that in the... Okay, maybe I am saying that in a little bit. It's one of those things where you kind of don't understand her backstory. You kind of don't understand her motivation. You just don't understand everything that's going on. She cries over just a one tear where in the original Cinderella, dress was completely destroyed. It's yeah. one of those things where it just was like, uh, okay. But also the fact was that she uh, broke down way too early, which took away from the second time she broke down because now it's just like... Okay, now she's crying all the time, so this does not do anything for me. Um, I don't know. It was just really weird how they did that. The second one that I will definitely mention... Oh, God help me. This movie features my good friend, Mr. Matthew Broderick, and that being the live-action Inspector Gadget. Dear Lord Almighty. Was that a Disney movie? Yes. Yes, oh. it was a Disney movie. And I am still holding a grudge about it to this day. This was one of those things where, you know, the cartoon wasn't exactly one of those things where it was, you know, catchy or it was like, you know, earth shattering or anything like that. But it was still at least enjoyable to watch. So when they tried to make a, you know, live action Inspector Gadget, some people are like, oh, this could be actually really cool. And you have Matthew Broderick. Uh, uh, okay, that, that seems okay. He's kind of blandish. He's kind of just kind of awkwardly goofy. Um... That's weird. I, I mean, do we still get a Dr. Claw? Yes, we do. He gets a claw hand? Yes, he does. Awesome. But you can see his face. What? No. No. He was surrounded with darkness and shadows and no one saw his face and that just... The old... I, I... I feel like my brain is shutting down. Just It just was such a horrible deal. If anything deserves a reboot, it's that... Honestly, throw in Jim from the office to play Inspector Gadget. I'll be happy to have Dr. Claude not have a face. Give him a very gritty voice. Give him, give him his cat. Just let it be like the Inspector Gadget animated series. Let it be like that, and I'll be happy. 
and people, and that's one of the weird things is that I kind of enjoyed the second m- movie compared to the first one because it actually felt like an Inspector Gadget movie. And also, for the love of God, get rid of the talking gadget mobile. That just got so annoying real fast. So that 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 ends that rant. So that ends that rant. Yes, I. I, uh, I well, I. I definitely had Cinderella on my list, too. I think we both talked about that a little bit. Um, And I just kind of wanted to just go overview of kind of why I think I didn't enjoy Cinderella. I liked your take on all of that. Um, I thought it was also really good that she was, she just seemed kind of like a weak heroine. And she's, Cinderella is like the number one classic. I, I, okay. I guess Snow White might beat her, but I think Snow White is the first, but I think the first princess a lot of people really felt was like a symbolic princess was Cinderella. Um, And so we get these live actions from Disney, and honestly, Cinderella wasn't the first that wasn't very good. Um, But I just wanted wanted to look that up because I was like, I feel like in my mind, Cinderella is the first one that I think of that I'm like, yeah, it just didn't flow like a Disney movie would. But we do have films that were were there first. So the Jungle Book actually came first in 1994. Um, and that was with all real animals, all everything. So no CGI. So we can't really blame that one for not being a number one movie. It was part of its time. And then we got 101 Dalmatians, if you remember that, in the in the uh, mid-90s and the 2000s, 102 Dalmatians, which all were actually relatively pretty good movies. But um, in general, I think they lacked musicality. Like, they didn't really have a soundtrack like, like the 101 animated film. But I think at that point... John Hughes and Stephen Herrick, uh, the, the director and the writers, were trying to differentiate it from the animated film. And so then we get the crazy Alice in Wonderland, Tim Burton. And that was the same deal. It was trying to be super different than the animated film. And so people went and saw it, and they were like, eh. Like, all of these movies did I have to say, I believe 101 Dalmatians for the time it came out was a pretty big hit. And we all remember Glenn Close being Cinderella. The one redeeming quality from that movie. The one thing. Yeah, but it wasn't that bad. And I'm pretty sure, did the dogs talk? Nope. Oh, okay. (laughs) Well, okay. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so then we get some Alice in Wonderland coming in. And we're like, this is... Not what we expected, but it's definitely different. And like we were talking about, it went by the book. So we're like, oh, they're trying to differentiate it. Okay. Then we got the crazy new Maleficent. And we were like, whoa, this is not the Sleeping Beauty we thought we would get. It did have some music in it, but only at the end. They did put in some of the main songs, but... It definitely wasn't Sleeping Beauty. Again, very different than the original. And that's when they made the huge mistake of Cinderella. Because they didn't make it different. But they decided to cut out the music. (laughs) And I think that's where people's little, like, antenna of, this is bogus, like, started, like, pricking up. And I think that's why everybody kind of really didn't enjoy this movie as much because the live actions that they were already, the the live action remakes that they were already putting in play, I would count the Alice in Wonderland and Maleficent to be before Cinderella as in the big push for live action remakes. Alice in Wonderland being number one. I'm not going to count the Dalmatians. That was way before, like 20 years almost 30 years before. Um, And so I think the big reason why everyone's like Cinderella was felt like a middle finger to us from Disney is because they did not change the story because you can't. It's Cinderella. 
<laughs> if you change the story, you're done. We, we don't want to see it. But they just took out the best parts of a Disney film, which is the magical lyrics that these songwriters produce. Um, and so that's my explanation of Cinderella. But right after Cinderella, uh, only a, really a year after release-wise, The Jungle Book came out, and they were like, we have all the songs. And it killed. It murdered in, in the box office. Then you got the flop of Alice looking or through the looking glass. I didn't even see that one. Did you see that movie? I've seen bits and pieces of it, and it's literally one of those things where I watch it and I think to myself, I would rather not watch any of these movies again. It's just, it's just one of those things where it's like, oh, this person's sad. We need to make them happy. We need to do time travel. We gotta do blah, 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 blah. What? I, it is more complicated than I'm even ma- making it. I'm putting out the, like, easy version that I could honestly give into it. And it just... Uh, yeah. It, it's, it, it's, it's, again, that actually wasn't directed by Tim Burton, but I definitely think that the person attempted to be like, Alice in Wonderland, it's crazy, it's psychedelic, and you're like, okay, I don't want to see this. <laughs> right, right, you're like, I don't want to see this. Um, Kill me! The jungle, yeah, the Jungle Book, book murdered... It was great. It was a, a fantastic movie. Then they had Beauty and the Beast, which literally blew out all records. Um, then they had Christopher Robin, which did good. Oh, yeah. And then our, our last our last buddy is the Dumbo, and I, I am gonna I'm gonna blame the director. I'm gonna blame Tim Burton <laughs> for making it a, a, a elephant that really couldn't fly very far. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a full circle podcast. Take a shot. <laughs> so, but yeah, so I just wanted to add a different take on the Cinderella. I think they were attempting to go off what they had been in the past. The first movie that really did the flip around of a, like, oh gosh, people like music still is The Jungle Book 2016, um, which I think anyone who has seen it has felt really good feels and the creators and I believe the yeah the exact same director is going to be a part of the Lion King which is something I'll talk about later in the show but um but yeah that's kind of what I wanted to say that Cinderella came off of that path of let's try to make it a different thing it's not a live action remake it's just live action and so now they're calling the Jungle Book and Beauty and the Beast, Christopher Robin, Dumbo, all live action remakes. Meaning, like, expect the same story, expect the same feels about it. It'll have a little twist, like we know Beauty and the Beast, adding more information. But Cinderella did not do that. And that's why we hated it. Also, I didn't know that Christopher Robin created PTO, paid time off. Holy cow, my, my life is now different now because of knowing that. Just get <laughs> out of here. Uh, that, that was just one of those things where it's like, okay, so paid vacation. Okay, whatever. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> what a twist in this. Did M. Night Shyamalan make this movie? No, he didn't. <laughs> wow. Um, geez, Louise. So, I, I guess... Uh, another point that I could make uh, that we're both we both probably could probably tie into this one is uh, one of the things I know it's going to be a screwed deal. Even though this is kind of more of like they screwed us in the past, as well as things where it's going to be more towards the future. I know it's going to hurt us, and that's the Disney streaming service. A few oh, reasons why, yes. why that's going to be a situation where we feel like we're going to get screwed. Because the fact is that they've taken everything off of Netflix, so now they're creating their own streaming service, which is nice. And honestly, some people might say, well, it's not going to be that bad. They've had a deal. Actually, it was an article that I read that the um, that they said that they said that they're probably going to do uh, like six to eight bucks a month, I think, for the streaming service, which doesn't seem bad. But it does bring out the issue that we have to pay for another damn streaming service. We've talked about this already. A lot of us have already gotten, like, Hulu, Amazon, Netflix, all of these crazy deals, DC Universe, all of these, you know, uh, 
streaming services here. And now it's just basically like, oh, well, you have this on your favorite deal, Netflix. We're going to basically take that away and we're going to put it on our own deal where you still have to pay to do it. Why? This It was a great working relationship between you and Netflix. There were no issues. You guys just decide to really become a monopoly and literally just say, hey, screw you, Netflix. We're taking our stuff. We're making our own deal. It's going to be quote unquote better, even though they think that they're going to make like, what, 12 million subscribers by, I think it was like 2024, which, if honestly, if that's their quota, that's a really low ball to set your quota for, for 2024. Honestly, I would have expected it to be there by like 2020 at least. But I guess they're being somewhat, they're putting in some common sense, maybe? I don't know. It's just one of those things where, again, paying for another streaming network, I don't like it. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with you. And the worst part, I think, about Disney doing this isn't the fact that we're going to have a place where all of our Disney shows are, obviously. We all love that. We think that's going to be awesome. It's $6.99 to $8.99. Is a great price, right? We're like, oh, that's not even that bad. Netflix costs way more. But once Disney jumped ship, guess who else is jumping ship? NBC Universal is doing the exact same thing. Soon will Fox do it too? And will we have, I mean, like, where does it end? Like, it, it's not going to. Everyone's going to do this. We already have WB and DC having their own streaming service. So, it's it's just it's it's going to probably murder Netflix. Uh, I hope. I think Netflix is really trying to procure their own likability and their own kind of series that will like really pull them ahead. That's why they're probably partnering more with Dark Horse Comics than all the other comic book series. Because, like we said, DC and Marvel are owned by different people who are literally trying to take over the streaming, the streaming business. Um, one of the things that NBC is seriously talking about taking off of Netflix is the office. And I think everybody, myself included, understand that the office is one of those, like one of those series that keeps me wanting to go back to Netflix. Um, I think another one that Netflix is talking about, um, let's see, it says that three companies are launching their own streaming services next year, which is Disney, NBC Universal, and Warner Media, which Warner is the DC stuff. Uh, they're responsible for the TV shows and movies that make up 40% of what users' time are spent viewing. Um, so as much as people like The Crown and Stranger Things, they like Friends more. And Friends, I think, is part of the, I think it's NBC Universal. Um, Sounds right. And so non-original programming made up 72% of the time people spent viewing Netflix as of October 2018. 72% of your time on Netflix might be leaving Netflix in a year, a year from now. So, it might kill Netflix, we're not for sure. I know I know for a fact Netflix is really now striving to get those shows and that memorabilia out that, like, hey, like, remember, you watch us for this, you watch us for this. Um, and I know they're trying to strike up a deal to keep The Office and other pretty big shows, like Friends, they, they are talking about removing Friends, and you're going to be like, oh. What am I going to watch then? Like, what do I watch when I'm just trying to go to sleep? Just put on Friends. It's easy. Uh, so I, I 100% agree with you that Disney is kind of is starting this revolution to basically take Netflix and possibly Hulu out of the equation of <laughs> uh, of things that people watch. But it's it's a total business. It's a business decision. If you really think about it, Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime are destroying TV. And guess who owns a lot of TV? 
the mouse. <laughs> ABC, ABC7 and a bunch of there's like I think they have like 12 channels and so if you're paying for something that does not support their live TV yeah it's <laughs> it's, it's just not it's not on Disney's best interest to continue to be partners with Netflix but try to eat them yeah for, for those of you that were curious why Victory Bell was la- laughing, I pre- literally put on an elf's hat to try to get to my happy place. And the last one is really going to drive me insane. I'm just going to say that right now. But um, I, I believe you had another point uh, before we go uh, too deep into another spot where the uh, mouse has definitely kind of wronged us. And uh, this well, is going to be a pretty big one, too. Yeah, well, the one, uh, one of my big ones that I felt like the mouse was wronging us, <laughs> and we talked about this multiple times. I'm just going to say The Lion King. I'm not going to say that I'm not excited for this new live-action remake, but I just want to bring up something that we've been talking about consistently, is that it's it's not technically live-action. And I think in general, the mouse has been screwing everybody by putting out these new movies that are the exact same movies, but we have to go see them because they add something new or they do something again. And you're like, Oh, I gotta go see this. So it's not the fact that I'm not excited for the Lion King. I think it's the fact that they're just, they're just taking all of our monies and we understand that this is the exact same movie Guess what? Spoiler alert. Mufasa dies. Oh my gosh. He does. He's going to die in this new movie. And we already know this, but we're still going to cry because it's going to be great. Um, And so The Lion King, I think, just was up there really high because I had this whole rant about it. It's not live action and stuff. Like, I swear, if they do a Lion King, like, how are they going to do a Lion King? And then they're like, we're doing Lion King. And I was like, ah, I'm doing it. You called it. Uh, right, right. I'm like, ah, I remember, I don't know. It had to be like a year or two ago that we were like really discussing all of the movies we want to see mm-hmm. live action. And I was very upset about like, oh, what next? Are we going to get a, a, a Lion King? And then we're like, oh my gosh, they're having a Lion King. <laughs> but on the Lion King note, and just because this is the Thursday, the national release date of the Avengers, there are analysts that are predicting on comicbook.com that the Lion King may rival Avengers Endgame at the box office. Wow. And I just thought, because we're talking about both, uh, like this is a great article to bring up and talk about a little bit. Um, they think that the Lion King might have a bigger pull, especially in the foreign markets, uh, just because of how popular the Lion King was in 1994 and how people are so stoked. And just, they just got so many of the people that were influential in the Lion King in 1994. I mean, we, we got Elton John in there again, like doing the comp- compositions. So like, like, ah, uh, like it's, this movie is going to be remarkably amazing. Beyonce is in it, y'all. Beyonce is Nala. Beyonce. <laughs> Beyonce. <laughs> enjoy- it's Beyonce. But um, but no, I I I wanted to say that they screw us every single day by doing this stuff. But it's almost like like we're welcoming it. <laughs> Because they are, they're taking our money, and we really wanted to put it to the man. Be like, we're not doing this streaming service, I'm not paying for it. I'm not going to go see any of your stupid remakes that I already know what's going to happen. But, I do that. So, I I will pay for the streaming service, and I am going to go see Aladdin and The Lion King. Probably on opening night, they look great. (laughs) <laughs> I got I got royally screwed when they decided to recreate Deadpool two into a PG thirteen piece of crap. <laughs> the hat is gone, everybody. The hat has left the head. I'm towards talking about Once Upon a Deadpool. <laughs> Literally, the one movie that I did not 
I have benefits, let's just say that right now, for working at a theater. Literally went into it thinking, okay, maybe it's not going to be that bad. I fell asleep through about maybe a third of the movie, maybe half the movie. It was probably more of a blessing than anything, because the only thing that they really added on was the whole deal where Deadpool's talking to Fred Savage, and, oh, they bleeped up a lot of the violence, and they just took away all the good stuff. Why? Well, mainly because they want to see Deadpool become PG-13. They want it to appease to a younger audience. Um, let's see here. Deadpool 1 was one of the goriest things that you'll ever see. Made a lot of money. People loved it. No problem. Deadpool 2 happened. About same, if not maybe less gore. They try to make it more family related in a weird way, as only Deadpool can, as only Ryan Reynolds can. And it worked out perfectly. It was another financial success. They decide, let's just make it fluffy. Let's make it into something different. Let's make it PG 13, because that way it'll work with our status quo. Don't care about how it did in the box office. I really don't. All I cared about was the fact that they basically took our Deadpool and decided to make him go into a person that just says, the only F word that we say is Fred Savage, which, yes, I know I've said this on the podcast multiple times, but I say it as a joke, not as a real-life thing that Deadpool would say, because he would not. He would drop the F-bomb. He would drop the S-bomb. He would literally talk to somebody about sucking his peanuts, there's so much rage going on for me that this even happened. Thank God they decided to turn it back to a rated R deal. I'm okay with this. But the fact that that movie even exists at this day is beyond my recollection. And I need a minute. So please, Tori, take over for a minute while I take a breather. <laughs> no problem. Um, I definitely... Did not go see that movie. I didn't really think it would be any different than Deadpool 2. I don't think it really was, except that they did edit out the violence and the profanity and a little bit of the, you know, sexuality that has that was going on. And, I mean, violence, uh, violence, profanity, and sex is kind of what describes Deadpool as a character. So, if you take all that out, then uh, might as well just not produce any more Deadpool movies, because that's not Deadpool if it doesn't have any of that. So, I, I totally agree that making Deadpool a PG-13 film, even for the fact, like, I get why they did it. They didn't do it because Disney wanted to screw us all, even though it felt that way. They did it because they thought that, oh parents are complaining so parents should take their their kids to this one because it's way better for kids and we're disney and we care about the kids but um yeah kids don't get everything don't let these little kids take away our deadpool no you don't take your child to deadpool don't dress your child in deadpool gear that's weird that makes me think you're an awful parent. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, uh, like, no, you should not have Deadpool on your shirt. That is like putting a penis on your child's shirt, just walking around. You're like, okay, you think that's cool? I know some comics. I know what he stands for, and I wouldn't put it on my child's shirt. Stick with Captain America. Stick with Iron Man. Oh, Heck, even put Thor on his shirt. Those are all pretty good role models. But uh, Deadpool is not a role model for your child. So don't go see Deadpool with a child. Especially a child if you love. If you love the child, don't do it. It'll ruin him. Um, and that goes, I mean, I think that's kind of how a lot of scary movies are also doing. Like, the horror complex have dealt with that for a while now. Is like, like, oh, well, we don't want to make our horror films rated R because it takes away a good 50, probably percent chunk of people who would want to go see these. But you just have to, you have to think, is it, is it about the money or is it about the integrity of the film? And I think, I, I know a lot of horror fans are dealing with this and have been dealing with this for years. And I think that's going to be a new trend in with, with the Disney takeover is keep our superheroes that are not so super, but super crazy and weird 
R. We need them to be R. <laughs> I'm just imagining Ryan Reynolds listening to this show and literally getting a shirt that has a penis on it and putting on his kids just to spite us. <laughs> I know he wouldn't do that because he seems like a good dad. No, he is a good dad, but it just seems like he would do it just because I know that he's that kind of dick. I mean, we saw his deal with Detective Pikachu, so... Well, that was a total joke. I know. He did not leave his kids, so... so (laughs) Just making sure. Oh, he was joking. Um, And I bet you anything, his children have not seen his performance in Deadpool. Well, now they can with Deadpool once once upon a Deadpool because it's PG thirteen. Nope, it's probably too young. They're still probably too young for that. So yeah, thank God it's a blessing for them. Hopefully you kids are lucky. They respect it. Respect the ratings. Um, but yeah, do you want me to go with my final one? I only had one more. All right, go for it. So I think the last thing, because now we're kind of on more of the Disney Marvel side of things. Uh, the last thing that I think Disney screwed all of us with is not purchasing the X-Men sooner. So we now have Disney. Disney has announced they have purchased the X-Men. We know this. This has been almost a year now. Uh, We're still getting some crappy Sony slash Fox. I I don't forget. I think it was Sony that owned them. We're still getting some crap movies from them. Dang it. But uh, I think we're a little screwed because... All of these Avenger movies could have been so much better if we were able to add our great, great comic book team of the X-Men in there. And I think that that's kind of the next chapter that they're going to turn is like, oh, look, weird. They have a school for mutants now. And we're like, it's always been there, you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is one of the like best comic book series that Marvel has to offer. Way to go. Um, but, but yeah, we're, I'm excited that they have them now. Uh, I, I do think that the X-Men were pretty key in defeating Thanos, but I mean, we're obviously not going to get that. So that's fine. We'll deal with what we have. It's still going to probably be an amazing movie, but I just think, I think that we could, we could drive it back to, you know, the 80s when Marvel had to sell off its characters and had to sell it to multiple people versus, like, one source. Um, but I'm going to just blame Disney for just not, you know, buying it all at once and spending a ton of money on all of the Marvel characters. As we see, once Disney does possess them, it get it produces gold. So Sometimes. <laughs> Um, I will say this, that your point actually does kind of tie into my final point, so I'll just go right into that. And it kind of does go into a little bit more of a future deal of how Disney is going to screw us, is that Disney is going to buy the entire studio business. Let me explain. And let me actually use this kind of example here, and this is probably the perfect example. Wrestling fans, you'll definitely know what I'm talking about. Non-wrestling fans... Here's a little education. All right. So back in like the early, like 1900s, I would say, um, they had a lot of these uh, territories for wrestling. Of course, WWE was more in like the Northeast. They had Jimmy Crockett promotions. They had the AWA. All these other promotions are kind of like spread throughout the nation. Well, of course, after a while, WWE decides to start slowly buying each individual promotion. And what that does is that it gives them a little bit more leeway to go to these promote, to go to these areas, produce their shows, do whatever they need to do. And they also get to claim that, oh, we're the ones that founded these stars. They were not relevant until they made it to our company. And obviously it kind of also funnels into what goes on with not things nowadays is that there's little to no competition because everything's getting bought out by WWE that everybody's almost getting to the point where it's like they want to get away from WWE, but somehow WWE finds a way to get them to circle back, whether it's with the WWE Network, whether it's bringing somebody that they saw for the independent scene into the deal. Basically, you have that same situation going on with Disney. They're buying all of these, you know, all of these franchises, all of these studios, and while it seems like it could be a good thing and it could create some great 
you know, golden moments. And to grant it, they have gotten some great golden moments. I think that when they got Marvel, that was probably their biggest deal. When they got George Lucas films, they had probably one good gold nugget out of it, and that was The Force Awakens. They had all of these studios that they're buying out of this, but the problem is that all of these studios being bought by Disney, you have to remember that now all these movies are probably not going to feel the same. They're not going to feel like they were back in the day, and they're not going to feel like competition to Disney because, unfortunately, they are within the Disney realm. So sometimes you might think, well, okay, we're going to get a new, let's say, like a new Child's Play movie. Well, if that's owned by Disney, you know that they're going to try to find a way to, like with Deadpool, find a way to make it so that everybody can watch it, everybody can be part of it. And that takes away from that nostalgia that we had, you know, with the original Child's Play movies. Um, And you have all these deals, you're just creating... Disney's basically turning into a major monopoly where they're going to be the only ones there and it's going to happen the same way. Somebody's going to try to get away from Disney, but Disney's going to just rub them back and be like, there's nowhere else you can go except with us. So it's kind of one of those things where that's where we're going to be royally screwed is that if Disney buys every single studio, then there's no way that you guys can, you know, enjoy any other form of entertainment unless you go out of the nation more than likely. And that just seems like too much of a hassle. So unfortunately, you're stuck in the Disney loop. Yeah, no, I 110% get what you're saying. And I mean, that is like why people enjoy capitalism usually in general. But we do have this this danger of having someone get too powerful and own so much that they try to monopolize things. Monopolies are illegal. But at the same time, it's like, there's always the threat of that, of like, hey, like, this company is getting so powerful that they own everything. And Amazon is an, another one that is like, oh, Amazon owns everything. Like, ah, like, everybody's shopping at Amazon, and it's taking out a lot of the businesses, like Macy's, and even Walmart itself is closing down some stores because they cannot compete with the the ease of Amazon, and you're like, that's Walmart. Walmart is one of those stores that, like, owned everything, too. And you're like, whoa, Walmart has to close some things because of Amazon? Like, that's, it's dangerous. Um, But it is, you're allowed to, you know, start a business, and if you are dominating at business, there are going to be ways that the government can, like, like, hey, like, you can't buy everybody, but at the same time, it's like, hey, they're good, and they're good for a reason, and the, the thing is that we have to own up when it's not good, and you have to not buy if it's not good. Don't continue to use these products or support it if it's not doing a good job. That's when it gets dangerous. Like, it, like the movies that we don't like from Disney, you gotta say, like, hey, you did a bad job. We don't like it. We're not gonna do this. We're not gonna go to this movie. Like, I think that's kind of how you try to like, negate that, is that you cannot support them for everything they do, because if they start sucking, you've got to go somewhere else. You have to try to figure it out, but that's, that is definitely a, a danger. It's going to be a tough one, so that is our list of ways that we feel like we are going to be screwed by Disney, so guys, we'll see if some of these predictions actually come true. We'll have to probably wait within the next year or two. Who knows? I may have called it here, and I am dreading the day that I have to sit there and realize, oh, Disney owns every studio. It's like, God, I called it. Now we're stuck in the Disney loop. (laughs) And I will expect so many people to message me just saying, you called it. It's like, I don't want to be right with this. Please leave me alone. Let me just be in my solitude of shame right now. (laughs) All right, guys. So let's, <laughs> let's take a let's take a short little commercial break, and then when we come back, guys, we will be doing a lot of hyping for Avengers Endgame. We're also going to be talking about some things that we are going to be predicting going into the movies tonight. So stay tuned, guys, because the Endgame is going to be happening soon. Check out the guys over at Eclectic Media Project. They bring you podcasts such as Musically Challenged. Whose podcast is it anyway? Want to hear something interesting? And their newest podcast, page 3.14 News. Check them out on Podbean and iTunes at Eclectic Media Project. 
on their website at www.eclecticmediaproject.com. Check them out as they are the home with a little something for almost everyone. You're listening to the Game Changer Podcast here on Speaker.com. All right, guys, I'm Nate the Effing Great, joined here by Victory Bell. I've got my Infinity Stone ring on. Let's talk Avengers Endgame. It is premiering tonight, you guys. It is going to be absolutely, probably one of the best, if not the worst, movies of all time. I only say worst because emotionally, it's probably going to cripple your heart. I'm just going to say that right now. I've already got my tissues ready in my car, so that way, if I do have the waterworks running, it's all good. And I'll even have some backup just in case somebody right next to me is just like, do you have an extra? I'll be like, yeah, sure, here you go. Just, (laughs) Just being a pal, being a pal for the Marvel Universe. All right, so we do have some stories that we want to talk about, but then we'll go into some predictions on some things that we think are going to happen with uh, Endgame. And also we'll be kind of reviewing them next week, you guys, because I think it's actually a pretty interesting concept that my co-host actually brought up that I think that would be really interesting. So let's actually not waste any time going into these stories. Victory Bell, what have you got for us, first off? Um, in general... Uh, I've got quite a bit of news, but uh, trying to just stick with the end game. Um, I've heard from BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed News, that the characters, and, and this is not anything that is super new, but they're just confirmations. Uh, people are wanting some confirmations. It's not really a spoiler. Um, but Captain Marvel, Valkyrie, Ant Man, and Hawkeye fit well into the Avengers Endgame. I know people um, have been worried about why they didn't put Valkyrie in before and why Captain Marvel took so long to come up, and I think that was like some of the main criticisms for Disney and the Marvel Universe. Um, but screenwriter uh, Stephen McFleely <laughs> told BuzzFeed News, and it's spoiler-free, but Everyone has been really pleased. All critics have been pleased with how they added all of these characters that weren't in Infinity Wars back into Endgame, and they fit seamlessly. Uh, So I think that's one story that is kind of really big. I thought this story was a little bogus. It just... It kind of goes with who's in and who's out. But it was really funny. Like, I, I clicked on it because, like, people were like, this character is definitely not in Endgame. And I was like, whoa. Like, they made this big announcement. And I thought it was funny, so I want to tell people. Um, <laughs> after uh, Stellan Skazgard, who was the professor in Thor, and he was also in the Avengers first movie, Dr. Eric Selvig. He has come out and said he is not in Endgame. Oh. <laughs> and I just thought that was super funny that they made, like, a big deal about it. <laughs> because I don't think anyone was like, what? That professor Eric Selvig isn't in Endgame? What? I'm like, I feel like no one's saying that. But <laughs> just the actor himself, like, he was like, uh, yeah, no, I, I wasn't a part of that. <laughs> like, they made a whole article. And a huge announcement about it, but he was like, "Yeah, no, I, I, no, I wasn't a part of it." <laughs> <laughs> like he thought it wasn't a big deal either. He's like, "No, I'm not like that. I'm not like a superhero." <laughs> but but Tori, there were so many people that were hoping that he was going to be a part of it. There are so many more people that are hoping that Jane Porter, Natalie Portman, was going to be a part of this movie. She was such a critical character in Thor. And I can't say that <laughs> with a straight face. is a relatively big character in the Thor franchise. But yeah, they definitely were like, screw it, we don't want these characters in it. Um, and yeah, uh, in the Thor franchise, Jane Jane is a big deal. Jane is kind of why Thor stays on Earth and stuff, and why he fights for Earth. He's like, oh, I I love Jane. Toss and love Jane. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But, but yes, uh, 
I, I do think that it, it is pretty funny that that they thought that this was a big deal. Oh, man. I, I will say this. One thing that was kind of a big deal, which I don't think is going to be much of a spoiler, but it's kind of one of those things where it was kind of cool that it happened. Uh, during the Avengers, I think, red carpet event, they, of course, had you know a lot of the the actors, everything like that, showing off the... Uh, one person who kind of stood out in this entire deal was Brie Larson. Not only did she look absolutely gorgeous in the dress that she had, but she also... On her, I think it was her left hand, she actually had uh, a bracelet that also had uh, jewels that looked awfully like Infinity Stones. So it was kind of one of those things where it's like, wow, this is kind of cool. And it's kind of one of those things where me as a fan, I'm just like, could this be a sign of foreshadowing? Could we see something like her getting Uh control of the Infinity Stones? I'm not going to go into... If if that's if that's a spoiler, I apologize. That was not intended. It's just one of those things where in my head I'm like, Captain Marvel with the Infinity Gauntlet actually seems like a really beautiful sight. I kind of want that to happen. It's probably not gonna happen, but it's one of those things where it's like that would be kind of cool just to see that. Yeah, no, that's that's really cool. I did not see that uh, her bracelet, but I do know that they do have some bracelets. Probably hers is probably legit and real, like with rubies and you know, sapphires and stuff like that. Well, wow. everybody else, if you're looking for an Infinity Stone bracelet, they do have the lava bracelets for kids. <laughs> which are literally wow. just the little beads <laughs> that have colored beads that could possibly be mistaken for Infinity Stones, but they're not. <laughs> See, that's why I went with the Infinity Stone ring that I got at SuperheroStuff.com. Definitely check it out, you guys. Cheap plug. <laughs> um... It's just one of those things where, like I said, it looks beautiful, it looks cool, it paints a very nice visual in my head, but I'll have to wait until tonight to see if that becomes a reality. Um, it's going to be very, very cool to see, you know, what goes into play. Like you, like you said, you mentioned some of the characters that are probably going to, that are confirmed other than the, you know, the Avengers. Um, we're going to get some other people involved in that too, so th- this is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, um, and so more news, and again, this is not necessarily a spoiler alert, Mm -hmm. but it's just news that you probably want to know. Um, The Avengers Endgame doesn't have end credit scenes. They said there is something at the end, but there's no scenes. So if you're somebody who is, you know, always stoked, which I feel like all of us Marvel fans are, um, we're always pretty stoked about, like, oh, okay, what are they going to show us? What are they going to show us? Um, they're not going to show us anything. So there, I, I believe there is uh, something at the end that is more of a thank you, but it's nothing that you're going to really need to see in order to continue following the Marvel Universe. So if you're somebody who's like, okay, I, I work tomorrow... At 6 in the morning, I'm going at midnight, and do I have to wait through this 7-minute long? Because it, it's a huge movie, guys. These end sing- or The end credits are going to be long. So if you don't have to sit through, if you don't care about a, a kind of a nice tribute, I think, is the only thing that is at the end, then uh, go ahead and leave the theater. Uh, I thought that was something that everybody should know. It's not really a spoiler. It's more of a common decency <laughs> honestly i saw a tweet that actually posted that and there was one guy literally at the end who was just saying i really don't care i'm just gonna sit throughout the entire deal and it's kind of one of those things where you know you mentioned that and maybe it's just gonna be another uh maybe it's another special tribute to stan lee i mean this is probably going to be the last movie that we see a stan lee cameo uh, if that if that is the case and this is his final one, it's going to be one of those things that everybody's going to cherish no matter what. Um, if that's not the case, then well, they, they, there's got to at least be some kind of you know mention of him dur- during this movie. Yes, exactly. I I, I think it's going to be more fan based thank yous, but um, I didn't really want to read too much into it because I personally don't like spoilers either. 
but I saw, you know, the big headline of no end scenes, and I think that's a big deal for a lot of Marvel fans like ourselves, so I needed to state it. I also have a Facebook friend who was lucky enough to go see Endgame in the pre-release, the two days, so it was, uh, I believe, Tuesday night. Oh, nice. And no spoilers again, but this is a, a... a costumer that I, I follow before and seen him at a few cons and he was l- ranting and raving about this movie. He's like, there are no spoilers in this post, but all I can say is they need to stop making movies because this is the best movie ever. <laughs> nice. And so I just thought that was a really kind of a, a cool thing I saw and a, a cool thing to just kind of note is that somebody that I know who's a big comic book fan um, has already approved of the movie. Uh, I'm very stoked to go see it myself. I definitely commented and was like, thank you for not spoiling. And definitely hashtag no spoilers. But there are people who have already seen the movie and I've already gave it a pass. I have not seen what the Dean's List have given it, which I, probably, I kind of want to know now if, if they rated it already. Uh, I don't know if that's not until Friday, but I, I do want to go see that. Um, do you have any other stories? Uh, honestly, oh, you know what? Um, there was one because there okay, was a. I have uh, one more, but I'll wait for you. I, I mean, it, it's more of like a heartfelt story. I actually posted this up on our Facebook fan page as well as my Facebook uh, page, where um, we're act, we're actually. Uh, a, a woman was basically talking about how ever since uh, she and her husband first started dating, he had her watch every single Marvel movie. And it was one of the coolest things there where she seemed like she tolerated it for the most part. Um, and they were excited to go see Endgame, but I think it was about eight months before... Um, it was either six, six to eight months before... Um, Endgame was released. Uh, her husband passed away. So, one, so one of the things that she did is that she's actually going to go see. Uh, I, I think it, I think this might be a direct quote, but I might be paraphrasing this a little bit. So I apologize if I do not get this right. Um, what she said was that she was going to go see uh, Mar- Avengers Endgame for the both of them. It's one of those things where it is just a testament of love at its finest, true love at its finest. And the fact that, you know, Marvel and her husband affected her so much that she's going to go see Marvel Endgame, and it's almost going to be one of those situations where she's going to watch it, and her husband is probably going to be right next to her. We all know that. And she already knows that she's going to be crying through that, as we're all going to be crying through it. Um, It is going to be... A very emotional time, and it's a really nice little story that is on there. But it also, again, just shows the commitment that she had to her husband. That much commitment to go see Endgame in honor of his memory. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I think there's going to be a lot of. I mean, Marvel. It, it's what twenty two movies, almost almost twenty years in the making. So it's definitely going to have some feels that. Uh, nostalgic feels for everybody who has participated in the, you know, Thursday night movie, movies at midnight type of deal. I think that's something I I know that I've had friends come and go that I used to go see Marvel movies with. So it's like, oh, now they're gone. But hey, you you keep with people who who still love it with you and you try to make it a, a, a great social event because that's what going to the movies is supposed to be it's supposed to be bring your friends family enjoy the show um but no that's that's really cute i just think uh my last story was something that i think everybody has been kind of sharing around facebook uh i'll i'll give a shout out to the age of the geeks uh they're the people who i saw the share from i know that it's all over now um but just saying about this year in general, in 2019, how many things are ending for us who have been 
nerds and followers throughout, you know, the past, like I said, like 20 years, probably. Even longer for some of, of the nerds out there. But in 2019, Marvel will close out a story told across 22 movies with Endgame. Game of Thrones will end. Star Wars will officially finish its saga after 42 years. An emotional year for nerds everywhere was the post. Um, and just in general, it, it's it's so true. Like, there's all three of those kind of giant nerd franchises are coming to a close in 2019. So I guess that leaves the question of, like, what's next? What is going to fill the gap in... It's kind of exciting because obviously Star Wars and Marvel are still going to produce things, um, but I think a, a big thing with Game of Thrones is like what is going to be everyone's new nerd craze, and I think it's cool. I think people are like, oh, like endings are so sad, but you got to remember, like with every ending is a new beginning. So, what are we going to follow now, guys? We're excited. <laughs> I'm going to say this. If Rob Fury, you were the one that made that post, I officially hate you for, in this brief period of time because you're bringing out so many emotions in one post right now. If it's not Rob, I'm sorry, Rob. It was <laughs> well, Rob is the president there, so he's probably backing it. So you could blame Rob. <laughs> well, if backing is one thing. To actually write it, that's another thing. That's just how my, my mindset works. Yeah, I don't think I don't think they're the first ever people to have shared that, but it, it's all over Facebook now, so you'll you'll see it. I've well, shared it. I, I think a ton of people. I don't know who started it. It wasn't probably their original idea, but they definitely shared it. So I'll give them my originality for it. They're, they're the first ones in my eyes. That's all that matters, I guess. <laughs> um, all right, so guys, we're going to go into some. Uh, Brief little predictions here, because last week, uh, after the show was over, we kind of talked about this. Uh, we're actually going to be predicting uh, three different things. Uh, one, moments that are going to be emotional, mainly, you know, that are going to bring out the waterworks, that are going to make you just feel just absolutely, just, oh, they'll get you right in the feels. Uh, second one will be for shop shocking moments that we'll be predicting throughout the movie end game. so obviously moments that just... Make us go like, okay, we did not see that coming. And, of course, the ever-so-classic comedic moments, times that just made us laugh. So let's start off with the, well, let's start with the comedy one. Let's go let's go softball, and then we'll go hardball all the way to the, the end with emotional. So, Tori, comedic moments, how many do you predict are going to be involved in Endgame? And so let's just, let's make this really clear of okay. what we're talking about. So not like a, <laughs> uh, I want this to count as, and, and I know you're going to go see Endgame multiple times this week. I don't know when we're going to be talking about Endgame because I do know like we're trying to give a little bit more time than usual because of all the sellouts that have been all around. And I've heard some theaters are staying open 24 hours to, to the show. Yeah. AMC, you're lucky you're not working for them. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> like, they literally, like, there was a post saying, like, some AMC theaters staying open 24 hours, so if you're waiting in line, just remember, an AMC employer is having a worse week than you. <laughs> <laughs> that is um, fair. Definitely quite humorous. Um, but yes, so, I want this good laughs tally that you do is when the theater breaks out in a laugh. Okay. So it's like, it, it's the typical thing in a theater. You know those moments when you have the, ah, like the whole theater's laughing and you miss some of the movie. You're like, God dang, shut up. <laughs> like, what was what was said next? We don't know. The whole theater was laughing. So that's what we're talking about by, how, like, good laughs aren't like the, <laughs> that was funny. It's the, ah, like the roar of the theater laughing. Um this is really hard. So I didn't write my predictions ahead of time. I'm like, okay, so it's a three-hour film. It's a Marvel film. I'm going to give it a good solid six laughs. Six solid laughs across the table. I could be downplaying it, but that's my that's my guess. How about you? Honestly, I was going to give it a seven. I think that there is going to be quite a bit. Um, there are going to probably be some more moments that might overtake it, but I think that that's a fair amount because they do have to add some kind of comedy in there to kind of break some of the tension. I think that would be more than enough. Plus, I mean, you got, you know, you got Nebula in there who has kind of like this 
very straight-faced kind of sense of humor, and uh, Karen Gillian does a fantastic job of that. Also, Bradley Cooper, Oscar award-winning Bradley Cooper. We might say that right now. Um, uh, so he's no, just going to have some funny people alive. Ant Man's alive, but uh, oh. we want it to be like a full-out theater laugh. I, I do. We might be downplaying it, but yeah, I, I'm just like I, it's three hours. But I personally don't want too many laughs because it's supposed to be a really serious like. We kind of want it to be a, a movie that's going to be like, oh, dramatic, like, oh, like the laughs will be nice, but I, I do hope that there's like those moments where, um, where it's like Infinity War when, uh, when Mantis and Drax were basically talking about, you know, what they were there for. There's like, you know, take ass and take like a, you know, take name kick and kick ass or something like that. And yeah, then there's kick Robert, ass and, and uh, yeah, take kick a- ass. No, 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 kick names, take, take ass, ass or Yes, something. yes, yeah. yes. Because that, that it was definitely the wrong thing, and people were like... <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was one of those moments where, of course, you see, like, Robert Downey Jr. and Peter Parker, they have that face of just, like, we're kind of boned here, aren't we? And, of course, the theater just uproariously laughs there. It's yeah. one of those moments where it's like, I think they knew it was going to be a hilarious moment, so they just kind of had that brief pause in there. Just to let yeah. the people let it out. I hope we at least get like maybe one or two moments like that, because that would be perfect. So that way people don't miss anything. Right, uh, right. That's that's literally what I'm saying. I'm probably gonna go see it twice somehow within this week. I, I haven't bought tickets for two times yet, but but yeah, I know we're gonna miss some things because of these laughs, and so that's why we don't want too many of them. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> All right, so the next one is going to be the shocking moments. So obviously moments that are going to make us go, you know, drop in awe. And even if we have, like, a moment where there's, like, a giant gasp in the audience, I think that will make it even that much better. Uh, yes. For this one, I, I'm i going to give this one a... I'm going to give it a 10. I think, I'm gonna, I think there's going to be enough moments in there that are going to definitely really just make us gasp and actually just take a moment just to think, did we just really see that? Did that just really happen? Um, and honestly, I think that's a fair number, especially for a three hour movie. That's like almost like three yeah. every hour. Yeah, that seems about right. I'm going to go with the 10. <laughs> okay. And is this, is this jaw droppers, personal jaw droppers for us or it is the audience? Uh, let's, yeah, let's stick with the audience. Okay, so the audience members like, oh, yeah. um, hmm. I guess I'll do an eight. All right. As I do think that people, I'm hoping they're not that surprised when people are not maybe coming back. <laughs> but but we don't know. We don't know. Right. Exactly. All right. So this is going to be, of course, the hardball one, the hardest one for us, and that is going to be the most emotional moments in the entire movie. Now, here's where it's going to be different. These emotional moments have to hit us. Not not the audience. It has to hit us. Uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you guys this. I'm just going to tell you right now what mine is going to be. I'm giving this one a three. The only reason why I'm giving it a low number is because I think it's only going to take three emotional moments, three tear-jerking moments, for this movie to be an utter success. So I think there's going to be only three moments in this movie that are going to really bring out the waterworks, but they are going to be the best damn emotional moments of the entire movie, if not in all of cinema. So I am going to agree with you, but I did pick four. I picked four. That's my lucky number. Um, and I only think four because I am going to stay all the way till the end. And I think we need to count whatever's at the end. And I might cry again at the end. Fair Just because it might be a very nostalgic moment. So I'm, I'm agreeing with you, but I'm throwing in that end cry that I'm going to probably have. <laughs> it, it did not even occur to me until that, but I'm still sticking but with I, the I wrote down four before you put down your number. I'm that like, okay, this is why. So that's funny that we both were like depicting three is a, a is a pretty magical number there. So, and I mean, and again, hashtag no spoilers, but we do think that there are probably going to be at least two people that we really like 
not coming back. So that was, two was an easy guess right there. <laughs> um, and I'm hoping they separate those moments, by the way. Yeah. Don't, don't you hope? Like, I, I don't, because, you know, as much as people were, like, very upset when, like, you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust happened. Um, but they didn't separate the moments enough for me to really get my feels going on. So I hope with this, this might be, they, they're going to separate it so that we get time to remember who might not be coming back. <sighs> no, I think that's absolutely fair. I think that yeah. you're absolutely right. I have one other thing that I would like to ask you, and okay. I think this is just going to be to really just be odd and just funny, and everybody who goes to midnight shows kind of, like, I think knows this. Do you think we're going to get some claps and cheers when heroes show up? Are we going to get a clap and a cheer at the end of the movie? Are we going to get these claps? Because you know the people, the people do that sometimes. Do I think we're going to get the claps? Oh, so like basically... Like the end of the movie, you're like, Whoa, oh my gosh! Oh, oh man. <laughs> um... I think that they are going to save the claps for when everything is all said and done. I'm talking like end credits are done. They do everything in the book. They do like all the thank yous and stuff like that. That's when I think the claps are going to happen. I think that everybody's just going to remain silent when the credits are going on. I think they're going to just kind of like soak everything that's, you know, happened. Then after that's over, then that's when they can, you know, be there and just be in that moment and realize this was an amazing movie and do the claps. So do I think it's going to happen, you know, before the end, before the credits? No. Do I think it's going to happen after the credits? That's my prediction. Yeah. I think it's just a yes or no answer. For so this. I, I guess for me, it's a no. Just to be fun. And I'm, I'm going to say yes too. Like I'm like, it's going to, I think it's going to happen. I hope we don't get that bogusness of during the movie. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but as a, a person who used to be an extreme Twilight fan, um, people used to, would, keyword. <laughs> yeah, people would like once people got on screen, people would be like, "Whoa, oh my god, yes, I love you!" And you're like, "Shut up!" I talk. <laughs> we've been talking during this movie. I'm gonna smack your face off. <laughs> so I'm hoping we don't get anybody that oh, Captain America's. First time on the screen, like, oh, we love you, we love you. Like, if you do that, something's bad. Something bad is going to happen to you. I'm going to have some candy with me, I know. <laughs> we'll have a candy, and you're going to have it in your eye. Yeah. Probably Maybe I will most. just bring, like, jawbreakers for that. I'll be like, all right, I'm going to have some jawbreakers on me, and if you, if you cheer during the movie when we're trying to listen, you won't get a job breaker in the back of the head. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was gonna say, I think it's one of those situations where you need to have like the legit job breakers, like those um. Oh, those huge ones. Yes. Oh, <laughs> that that'll 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 serve as a threat. I hate crime. <laughs> I hate those people that cheer at movies so much. I bring giant job breakers. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! There, I, that needs to be like what? That needs to be like a photo shoot deal where you just literally have like, like two of those massive jawbreakers in your hands, have that look of just death, and that's all your caption is. Is just like anybody who cheers during when I'm trying to watch yeah, a really if you're good movie cheering during Endgame. I've got all Infinity Stones with me. <laughs> I got Infinity jawbreakers. Stone jawbreakers. <laughs> uh. I wonder if, if someone did do that, bought, like, all the Infinity Stone colors and Jawbreakers, could they finish all of those Jawbreakers by the end of the movie? Ooh. That would be a great challenge. That Maybe would... you should try that. Uh, how about no? I like, <laughs> I like, I like, I like I would my never, job. <laughs> my teeth would be gone, um, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I, I would need dentures before I even get into retirement. That's sad. Right? Like, I, and I don't like jawbreakers like that. Yeah. If, if a candy takes me over 20 minutes to eat, it's not a candy for me. <laughs> hey, fair enough. 
All right, guys, so that's going to wrap it up for this edition of the Game Changer, calling it the Avengers Endgame Edition Preview, you guys. Definitely check it out. It's going to be absolutely phenomenal. Already, Did we get some course, tricks in this podcast? Hope you guys liked it. Woo. Definitely give us the likes. No spoilers. No no, spoilers. And hashtag no spoilers for this movie. Of course, check out Victory Bell on our Facebook fan page. Leave her a like. Give her some comments. But be nice about it, ladies and gentlemen. Otherwise, she will stick some jawbreakers on you now. And, guys, <laughs> I'll break your jaw with my breakers. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And uh, guys, follow me on Twitter at Real F and Game. Follow us both on Instagram to check out a lot of the exclusive as well as great photos that we have. More from her than from me, to, let's be honest. Also, be sure to check us out on Spreaker.com, uh, Spotify, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, as well as on YouTube. And guys, I'll tell you this that not only will I get the chance to do back to back Avengers Endgame. Uh, showings for tonight and tomorrow, but also on Friday, for those of you that are going to be in the Oshkosh area, be sure to check out ACW Water City Wrestling Con, where I will have a booth with myself, Taylor, and Max. We will be doing a nice little meet and greet during the deal, and we will be doing a two-hour show from five all the way until the ring bell at seven o'clock, you guys. So definitely come on by, say your peace, have a great time, and listen to some of our predictions for the show because it's going to be absolutely amazing. So for Victory Bell, I've been Nate the F and Great, and just remember, you spoil it, it all ends with a snap. See you next time. I like it. <laughs>